Morning. Welcome to Holy Family Parish. I don't know why you're here. <laughs> My memory isn't going that far. What we'd like to say is that Father Collins and I are grateful for your presence. We're thrilled to be able to celebrate our 50th anniversary in the priesthood. We started out 60 years ago in the seminary, and here we are 60 years later celebrating our 50th anniversary. So we're thrilled to be with you, people that have made you know, our priesthood so rich and rewarding. So thank you for being here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, to you, my brothers and sisters, that I agree greatly sin in my thoughts and in my words, what I have done, what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. And therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to Lord our God. May mighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, and mercy on us, you take away Let us pray. Grant, almighty God, that we may celebrate with grateful, heartfelt devotion these days of joy, which we keep in honor of the risen Lord, and that what we relive in remembrance, we may always hold on what we do. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Some who had come down from Judea were instructing the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the Mosaic practice, you cannot be saved. Because there aroused no little dissension and debate by Paul and Barnabas with them, it was decided that Paul, Barnabas, and some of the others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. The apostles and elders, in agreement with the whole church, decided to choose representatives and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. The ones chosen were Judas, who was called Bersabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers. This is the letter delivered by them. The apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia of Gentile origin, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number who went out without any mandate from us, have upset you with their teachings and disturbed your peace of mind. We have with one accord decided to choose representatives and to send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have dedicated their lives to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are sending Judas and Silas, who will also convey this same message by word of mouth. It is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us not to place on you any burden beyond these necessities, namely, to abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats of strangled animals, and from unlawful marriage. If you keep free of these, you will be doing what is right. Farewell. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the book of Revelation. The angel took me in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It gleamed with the splendor of God. Its radiance was like that of a precious stone, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a massive high wall with 12 gates where 12 angels were stationed and on which names were inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. There were three gates facing east, three north, three south, and three west. The wall of the city had 12 courses of stone as its foundation, on which were inscribed the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gave it light, and its lamp was the Lamb. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And with his spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever loves me will keep my word and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. 
I have told you this while I am with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have told you. Peace I leave, leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I will come back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. These words are taken from the 25th chapter of the book of Leviticus, and they are the introduction to what the Torah calls the year of Jubilee. For the Israelites, time was a sacred gift given them to but by them to God. The Psalms tell us, all time and all seasons belong to you, O Lord. The number seven was also considered a special number. It signified completion, the end of something. Perhaps they chose that number because in the ancient world they could see but seven heavenly bodies in the sky. And so those old Babylonians would worship one day at a time each of the seven gods for the seven planets. And at the end, they would have a week and then they would start all over again. So seven and time was important for the Jews. So any measurable time unit that was divisible by seven therefore was sacred to them. So, for example, we see that the seventh day is mentioned in Scripture as the day in which the Lord rested after having worked for six days. The Hebrew word for seven was sabato, and so it became known as the Sabbath, the seventh day. In their liturgical calendar, the seventh month was that of Nisan, and it is always during this month that they celebrate the key moment in their history, that of the Passover. And so on the 15th day of that month, they gather together to offer a sacred meal in thanksgiving to God for having saved them. Then there is the seventh year. After having worked hard for six, they got the seventh off. And so they applied the seventh day word to the seventh year, and it became the sabbatical, something all seminary professors and college professors like to get every once in a while. But the perfection of the sabbatical year was to have seven of them. And so seven times seven gave them 49. And so when they had completed their seventh sabbatical, then that was when they proclaimed the year of Jubilee, the year of 50. And they announced this opening of the year by whoever was in charge of the community to blow a horn. It is this Hebrew word for horn, yobel, that gives us jubel, jubilee, a year in which there is merriment and fun, but it really just means blowing a horn. When they blew that horn, it was a special one. They just didn't go down to the local store and buy a horn and blow it. It was called a shofar, 
not to be confused with the chauffeur who drives the car to get you to the Jubilee here. The shofar was a ram's horn, and it was significant to them because in the book of Genesis, when Abraham took his son Isaac up the mountain to be sacrificed, Isaac was spared by God because there was a ram caught in the bush by his horn. And so that ram's horn became significant. It meant freedom, to be set free from death and things like that. And so that's the beginning of the proclamation of the Jubilee year. Proclaim liberty, proclaim freedom. Now, if you had lived back then, it was a very good year in which to be alive because everyone was set free on the year of Jubilee. Slaves were given their freedom. It was the year of emancipation. All debts were canceled. If you owed anybody anything and you were alive at that 50th year, which in those days not everybody made it to 50, then their debts were canceled. They got to start life all anew. And so the year of Jubilee was one of freedom for many people. The good Monsignor and I are celebrating a year of Jubilee. But don't worry, we're not going to blow our own horns. We are going to blow the horn for all the people that God in his infinite wisdom has allowed us to set free. Every time we pour water on someone's head and say the words, I baptize you, we set them free from the devil and we give them a new life, just like those slaves were set free back in ancient Israel. Every time in the confessional we utter the words, I absolve you from your sins, we free them from the bondage of Satan again, and we give them another chance to have a new life in the church. Every time we visit a hospital or a sick room and say the words, through this holy anointing, may the Lord help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit, we many times are setting them free from the bonds of the earth as they prepare themselves to go see God face to face. Every time we walk into a classroom or stand up in a pulpit and we teach, then we are setting people free from ignorance so that they can learn more about their faith. And so the Jubilee year is not so much the celebration of the priest, it is more the celebration of those who have been set free by God through the priest, who is his mere instrument. Now, if those words proclaim liberty throughout the land seem familiar to you, I'm going to guess that most of you don't go to bed at night with the book of Leviticus on your sitting table right next to you and cuddle up with that. You may have seen those words emblazoned in a, in a bell that's in Philadelphia. Just go down to between 5th and 6th and Market and Chestnut, and there you will see a bell. Where did that come from? In 1750, 1701, Mr. William Penn granted religious freedom to anybody who came to his colony, proclaimed liberty. So Jews, Quakers, Mennonites, all kinds of people, Amish, even Catholics, came to Pennsylvania because they knew they would be free. And they even started churches here, Old St. Joe's, Old St. Mary's, St. Augustine's, etc. And there they knew that they could celebrate Mass freely without anybody banging down the door, running in and arresting them and hanging them for being in the wrong faith. So Penn's act of liberty brought a cosmopolitan epic here to Pennsylvania. And so 50 years later, 
a jubilee year, the city fathers of Philadelphia wanted to have a way to commemorate the freedom that had brought all this difference to Philadelphia. So they decided the state house needs a new bell. So they ordered one from England. And two years later, it came here. In 1753, and they were gonna put it up in the bell tower and ring it wildly. And then they rang it and it cracked. Well, they sent it to two people in Philadelphia, Mr. John Pass and John Stowe. That's how they get their name on the bell. And it came back again, and they rang it a second time, and it cracked. And it was never really repaired. They kept ringing it off and on, but finally when poor John Marshall died in 1835, it cracked a last time and they couldn't use it anymore. So now they just tap it with a little mallet whenever they want to do something. But in spite of its being cracked, that bell was very significant. It became the symbol for the liberty, which word was carved on it. In 1776, in the Civil War, African Americans used it as a sign of their liberation from slavery. In the 20th century, it was actually sent on railroad cars to get money for war bonds for World War I and II so that we could be free from the Kaiser and Hitler. And so even though the bell didn't work too well, it still fulfilled its function of proclaiming liberty. We priests are like that cracked bell. We're imperfect. When we read the description of the priesthood that's found in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that a priest is a man selected from men to stand as their representatives before God and to offer sacrifice for sins. And that he does not choose this honor for himself, but he is chosen by God. Now, this idea of men as priests, human beings, why didn't God pick angels? They're very good, they're almost perfect. No, he, he picked us for some strange reason. St. Paul tells us that God always chooses the weak to confound the strong. And for the past 50 years, we've been confounding you very well, I think. He takes those who have imperfections because they can relate to the people that they minister to because they too are imperfect. Hebrews tells us that when he's busy offering that sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, not to forget his own, that he's included in that ritual. When I was 25 years ordained, somebody asked me, are you doing anything special for your jubilee? I said, yes, I'm doing two very special things. At 6.30 in the morning at St. Alice Church in Upper Darby, I celebrated the Eucharist. And around eight o'clock, I started teaching sophomores and juniors at Cardinal O'Hara High School. And I said, that's two very special things because that's what God made us to do. He made us people who are going to offer a sacrifice. That's the most important thing we do every day of our lives. Imagine if the inquirer were to announce that Jesus Christ was coming to Hermitage Street on Sunday the 22nd of May and would be here in person. The place would be even more packed than it is now. Just think of when popes came here, the vicar of Christ. If Jesus himself appears, there should be a mob scene. And he does, and there isn't. I, my greatest wish as a priest is that I would like to see more people come to a realization of what this simple ritual of bread and wine is, that it's actually Jesus among them who has come to forgive their sins and then to go off and teach, because that was the last rule that Jesus gave the first priest, go forth and teach all nations. And so that is what we are called to do, no matter what the setting is. And so over these past 50 years, that's actually a, a century of priestly ministry, if you add the two of us together. 
a century, we have been privileged by God. It's not what we did for him, it's what he did for us. Because the book of Hebrews says, you do not choose God, he picks you. And you should be honored by that, not by the adulation of the people. And so in these century years of ministering to all kinds of people, we are grateful to God for allowing us to say mass, to forgive sins, to anoint the sick, to baptize, to teach. And in doing that, we are fulfilling the law of Leviticus. We are proclaiming liberty throughout the world. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, who in all things were made, rest men and for our salvation, and down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit, which is born of the Virgin Mary, became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He would come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess my baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead, the life for the world to come. Amen. Our risen Lord's greatest gift to us is that peace which the world cannot give, in his name, let us ask the Father for all our needs. Our response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For the apostles and elders of the church today, that they may deliberate and address the problems that arise with the same power of the Holy Spirit that helped the first apostles, let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. That the nations may have cause to be glad and exult as God rules them with equity and guides them through chosen leaders raised up by his mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the vision of the perfect and beautiful heavenly Jerusalem, gleaning with God's splendor and lit by the radiance of the Lamb, may encourage us to be living stones worthy to be laid in the structure of such glory, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that we may come to be a dwelling place for the Father by loving Jesus and keeping his word, thus enjoying the blessing of his peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the sick, the grieving, and the depressed, all whose hearts are troubled or afraid, that God may have pity on them and bless them, letting his face shine upon them in love and mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our faithful departed ones, that Jesus may take them to be where he is in the kingdom of his beloved Father, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We also pray for Monsignor Sweeney and Father Collins, who this weekend are celebrating the 50th ord uh, anniversary of their ordination. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our we pray for the people of Ukraine that once again peace and tranquility may reign in their land, let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our and for our own personal intentions, let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our 
Father, through these prayers, we ask you to come and make your home with us as we celebrate your love in this Eucharist. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Pray, brethren, my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. The Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. The praise of the Lord is in the name of the host of the church. May our prayers rise up to you, O Lord, together with the sacrificial offerings, so that purified by your graciousness, we may be conformed to the mysteries of your mighty love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. So let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But at this time, above all, to Lord you yet more gloriously, in Christ the Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death. By rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people, exult in your praise and even the heavenly powers with the angelic host sing together the undenting hymn of your glory as they acclaim. indeed holy, O Lord, and all you are created by the gifts you praise. For through you, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. You never cease to gather people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy, these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, o Lord, we celebrate the memorial of the saving and passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer him in thanksgiving the holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death 
you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by his body and blood of your Son, may be filled with his Holy Spirit and become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all of the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Nelson, our Bishop, and his assistant bishops. The order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people that you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned here before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all of your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There, we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow in the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that with the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Lord, and Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will to live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God, the ultimate takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to be pushed into my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Is it drop?
Let us pray. O my dear ever-living God, who restore us to eternal life in the resurrection of Christ, increase in us, we pray, the fruits of this Paschal Sacrament, and pour into our hearts the strength of the saving food, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So at this point, we certainly want to thank many people that contributed to making this a special day for Father Collins and I. First of all, Father Collins gave us a beautiful homily to reflect upon the priesthoods. So that's much appreciated. You can tell he's a seminary professor. <laughs> he's, he's modest. He's being modest up here, telling me nothing, nothing special. We do have something special for you over in the hall. You know, we want you to participate in a luncheon that's been arranged for you over in the hall. And uh, when you get over there, um, Jim Murphy and Holly, and Holly Scully will be directing traffic. We try to give everybody a seat. Of course, we made sure that we have everybody has a seat. There are 225 seats available, and there's a directory when you get over there. First, though, before you go into the hall itself, there is a kind of refreshment bar, you know, right there on the outside in the patio, uh, right in front of the auditorium. And if you don't know where the hall is, when you go out the front doors, you have to turn to your left, and it's the basement of the school building, which is right next door to us, uh, just maybe 50 feet away. But there is about uh, 15 steps that you have to go down to get to the hall. So um, going to the hall is you know, not hazardous, but you should take your time and hold on to the railing and go down the 15 steps and get to the hall. So it's out the front door to the left and down the steps. And hopefully this will be a special day for everybody that's come. Certainly a special that you're here. And the most important part about this was that we got the chance to say, you know, participate in the mass with you, whom we love very much and want to show certainly by our words and our deeds, you know, that we love the Lord as well, and that we love him more than anything, and we want you, and he wants you, to have a wonderful day. So bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May God, who by the resurrection of his only begotten Son, was pleased to confer on you the gift of redemption and of adoption, and give you gladness by his blessing, Amen. May he, by whose redeeming work you have received the gift of everlasting freedom, make you heirs to eternal inheritance. Amen. Amen. And may you, who have already risen with Christ in baptism through faith, by living in a right manner in this earth, be united with him in the homeland of heaven. Amen. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you, remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.